Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of 30 Minutes to Merge. I am your host, Beard of EDU. I think I might have missed you last month, uh, but I'm back and kind of better than ever. Um, new camera, so now you've got like a, a full like blow up of my face, which is kind of weird, but here we are. Uh, today on, to, uh, on today's 30 Minutes to Merge uh, session, I'm joined by a super awesome individual uh, named Joseph, who's going to be kind of diving into some security-related topics but uh before i bring him on stage i just wanted to give a quick introduction to him as a person so um as always i like to kind of ask a couple of questions before i bring someone on so uh his hobbies include uh tennis but he also plays a lot of sports uh but tennis seems to be his uh primary focus right now 
And when he's not watching F1 racing, he uh, is also playing chess at a championship level in London. Uh, so that's always a fun time. It's not necessarily something that I'm doing, but I've always been kind of intrigued by the game of chess myself. Um, he's currently not allowed to have any animals in his building, but if he was able to own an animal, he'd either want a French bulldog or a pug. Uh, so if you've got any favorite pug or French, uh, Frenchy picks, you can always share those in chat. Um, I also like to ask what people buy recently, just because I'm kind of curious as to what people are spending their money on. Uh, and he bought some new tennis balls, which makes sense because he plays tennis. Uh, but he also bought a replacement shirt because uh, he ruined the original shirt in the laundry. So a little laundry mishap ended up in a duplicate purchase. Uh, in terms of like where he's at in the open source world, he's got a couple of kind of dusty repositories uh, on his account. Uh, two, two that I thought were really interesting was one is uh, Intel One, which is kind of a, a command line driven uh, tool that identifies the open source footprint of an individual or an organization. So you kind of plug in some information about uh, an individual and it'll kind of pull up a whole bunch of information about where they're at in the open source space, which I thought was really cool. And then he's also got a couple of other repositories around uh, the blockchain uh, and different kind of simulations around those, which are really interesting. If uh, blockchain is something that you're interested in, you might want to check those out and just see what's going on. And then finally, I always ask like, if you could build an action uh, to do something kind of interesting outside of like your normal CI or CD, what would it be? And Joseph said he wants to, he, he had the idea of maybe connecting uh, experienced open source, con uh, open source maintainers with people who are newer to the field to kind of create this ongoing dialogue between, you know, the, the mistakes that they made, uh, the, you know, the experienced individuals kind of sharing information with the, the newcomers to the scene, uh, to kind of create an opportunity to grow the open source space and make sure that everyone's kind of successful in whatever they're trying to accomplish in that open source world. And, uh, without further ado, I'd love to bring Joseph out on stage. What an intro. I do so what much. I can. Thanks so much for having me. And who knows, maybe some people are already inspired by this final GitHub action. Yeah, it'd be really cool to see. Yep. For the next 30 really minutes, cool I'd get even more inspired. For sure. All righty. Well, I'm going to let you take it away, and I'll see everyone at the, uh, at the end. Sure. Thanks so much. So I'm sharing my screen first. Switching to my slides. So hello and welcome to this presentation from the GitHub Security Lab. My name is Joseph and I've had my dream job here at GitHub for the past four months now. I say this because I'm very passionate about our mission, which is to inspire and enable the community to secure the open source software we all depend on. My part in that mission is to make security easy for developers and this is why I'm here today to use those 30 minutes to give you the superpower of securing your code like NASA did. Well, this is not a science fiction or a Netflix scenario. 10 years ago, when NASA's Curiosity was landing on the surface of Mars, NASA engineers performed a code review mid-flight. They wanted to check the software responsible for opening the parachute of the Curiosity rover during landing on the surface of Mars. And that was when they found a bug. The snippet on the slide that is written in C is not the actual code, but a fair description of what was really happening. The little bug that NASA engineers discovered was that the function signature in line one expected an array of 12 elements, but an array of three elements would be passed as an argument in line eight. This means that the loop in lines two and three will read the correct memory coordinates just for the first three elements, but then it will go out of bounds leading to random behavior. The NASA team found out that this cause would prevent the parachute opening during the landing phase and lead to the crash of the Curiosity rover. The smart thing that NASA engineers did was that they didn't just fix that vulnerable instance, but they wrote a generic code QL query to look for variants of that vulnerability in all their code bases. What we call a variant is another occurrence of the same bug pattern at another place in the code, and they found 30 other variants. They analyzed that some of those would also result in catastrophic consequences, such as the crash of the rover. They fixed all the variants, and Curiosity was able to land safely on the surface of Mars. 
if we now see the bigger picture and compare this scenario of fixing a bug mid-flight to that of fixing a bug in production, then I'm sure you will agree that it is very late in the process of software development lifecycle. Last year, NASA sent another rover to Mars, but what, they have, but what have they done differently this time? They shifted security left by integrating CodeQL at the very beginning of the software development lifecycle by using GitHub. In two clicks, you can enable code scanning with CodeQL and get alerted about security vulnerabilities in your code. CodeQL is free for open source, and you can benefit from the continuously growing query set contributed by GitHub, by the community, and by top security teams like NASA's. That's already nice, as you can consume the world's, the world's security knowledge to secure your code. But in today's presentation, I will show you how you can not only consume, but be an actor in your use of CodeQL. Let's now introduce security as code through the lessons learned from DevOps and quality assurance. One of the main levers of DevOps adoption was the introduction of infrastructure as code, where developers use code for setting up their own infra without the need to open tickets to operations teams. The fact that developers were writing code empowered them with further benefits, such as reading, contributing, and understanding what they were doing. Same for the world of testing. In the pre-agile days, developers and testers belong to two separate teams. QA will find the bugs and report them back to devs. Nowadays, this methodology will, res will not resonate with the vast majority of developers as they progressed in taking ownership of the automation around code testing. So we believe that what worked for testing and operations should inspire us for security. With security as code, we expect the security experts of an organization to codify security knowledge that is then shared under both readable and executable form with developers. This sharing helps developers read, understand, and contribute to the code, which facilitates a security culture. Therefore, think about security becoming a seamless observer of the day-to-day -day DevOps that doesn't intervene or affect DevOps speed. Security as code will be integrated and automated to the pipelines so that every time a security-related violation exists, actionable feedback will be generated. By the way, you hear more and more people talking about DevSecOps nowadays, right? The vulnerability covered by our demo is an SQL injection or SQL injection. It depends where you're from. And I just want to introduce it here for those that might not, be might not be familiar with it. As per the meme on screen, this happens when a user is able to execute arbitrary queries on a database using SQL. The root cause of this bug is insufficient or missing input sanitization, allowing users to execute whatever database operation they want. The backend of the software on the meme will be similar to this. The text in purple represents the user input, which is processed and sanitized. The query at the top of the slide inserts the name Clio into the database. But the second example shows that by passing user input that contains the parentheses and semicolon, a user is able to trick the backend into creating a second query that deletes the student's table once and forever, while the third line with two dashes will comment out anything that the backend code would add after the user input. This is a very simple example, but in real life, user input flows in different places of your code base, through files and functions, before reaching the SQL execution. In our demo, we will build a query that automatically finds SQL injections in those complex scenarios. Just before the demo, Let's define two important concepts for our data flow query, sources and sinks. Sources are places in the program that receive untrusted user input, for example, a field in a web form. Sinks are places in the program where something malicious can happen if the malicious input reaches eventually these places. In our example, the sink is the place where the SQL query is executed. 
The question we need to ask is a data flow one. Does this untrusted data ever flow to the point of executing a potentially vulnerable action? We can answer this question by identifying all paths from sources to things by using CodeQL. Notice that CodeQL allows users to query code in general, not necessarily for vulnerabilities. You can use it for any type of bugs or just to explore your code. We try to make these queries generic to find variants of vulnerabilities like NASA did. And the biggest benefit you get is that you will now be able to codify your knowledge of a whole security bug pattern in an expressive query language. CodeQL is declarative and logical. Declarative means that we describe what to find, not how to find it. Logical means that you will use operators like AND and OR to define conditions about your domain. CodeQL is object-oriented, taking advantage of features such as encapsulation and inheritance composition. However, as a total beginner myself a few weeks ago, the feature I found the most useful to get started with was the existence of a rich set of standard libraries with reusable logic that made it quicker for me to be productive. For example, there are templates to use like the one of data flow analysis that we are going to see in our demo. Our demo is designed for total beginners. And while our examples are in Java, you, you don't need extensive experience with Java either as what I will show you will be transferable to other languages that are supported by CodeQL, such as JavaScript, Python, Go, Rust, C, C++, and C Sharp. Now, let's move to our demo. So this is VS Code, and I have the CodeQL extension being installed. Being installed. Let's first check our vulnerable code base, which is the intentionally vulnerable security shepherd from OWASP. We have an SQL injection vulnerability in a mobile app. The source is in line 98 and 99, where the program receives a username and a password for user authentication. This is because there is no sanitization happening, with the username and password variable being able to maliciously alter our database, like we've seen in our meme. And where this is happening is in line 147 where we have the raw query method accepting a query. So in, line, in that line, the first argument is essentially our SQL execution. If you're familiar with SQL, the structure of CodeQL may look familiar. We have the import clause at the top that allows us to reuse logic defined in other libraries. In this example, the Java's standard library. Then we have the query clause that describes what we are trying to find. It is made up of three parts normally, the from, where, and select. Let's first start with two of them, the from and select, before adding the where in a moment. From specifies the variables that are going to be used in the query. Every declaration in the from clause has a variable type, like method access here, and a variable name, like call here while select specifies what the result should be by referring to the variables above. As per our SQL injection explanation, we need to arrive at those methods or functions in the vulnerable code base that receive user input. How do we do this? We first need to start by getting the set of all methods in the program and then filter only those that receive user input. In the CodeQL Java library, to find method invocations, we can use the type method access in line three. And then we can use a variable that I called call here. You can use any variable name. And if we run that, we are expecting CodeQL to provide us with all method invocations in the program. So if I click here, for example, we have the make text function being called. And if I click here, we can see where the show function is being called. But the problem is that these are all the functions. We just need to arrive to those that receive user input. How do we do this? By using the WHERE clause. So by using the WHERE clause, I'm going to search specifically for those methods that are receiving user input. And to do this, 
I'm going to use my variable from above and the function called get argument, sorry, get method, because we are looking for methods, followed by has qualified name in order to have the specific method that I'm looking for. Look how I'm making use of the auto completion and how the inline doc helps me to find the right method in order for me to be productive and use CodeQL. Inside the where clause, we can also see the object-oriented nature of CodeQL because get method is an operation provided by the type method access, which through chaining provides further options, for example, to look for a function with a specific name. And this is another feature that CodeQL brings on top of SQL, which is expressivity with chaining. We can see from the signature of has qualified name that it is expecting a package name, which is android.widget in this case, because the vulnerable code base I'm using is based on Android, a type, which in this case is going to be edit text. Everything I use is visible in the code base, which is going to be your code base when you use CodeUL for your code. And finally, get text, because get text is the method that receives user input. And we are interested in that method because it's the source of an SQL injection vulnerability. So if we run this, we arrive at the instances of get text in our code base. So far, what you see is like a grep, command F, control F. But the true power of CodeQL is going to be visible in here, in the data flow. So let's continue towards that. Let's now move to syncs. To find syncs, we can use the same strategy, with the difference being that we are looking for a different method in a different package like we do in line four. As we saw, raw query takes two arguments. Let me show you again. 147 here. Raw query takes two arguments, from which only the first is of our interest, because it's the sync, is where SQL injection is going to be executed. So it's where the vulnerability is going to explode and have problems, cause problems in our database. So we can do this by using another type, which is going to be the expression type. And I will use a variable called argument here in order to arrive into the very first argument of the raw query method, followed by the logical operator end in order to impose even more restrictions on my variables. And here, I can impose this restriction by saying that I'm only interested in the first argument, therefore, as we are developers, the one in index zero. If we run this, we expect to arrive to the raw query instances that are having the first argument being defined. Now, let's continue with data flow. If I unzoom a bit, cool. So, so far, we defined how to find sources and sinks. Let's now move to the data flow functionality of CodeQL which is what is going to provide us with confirmed SQL injection findings. Luckily, the language comes with a rich set of standard libraries that have ready-made templates we just have to fill, like the one in front of us. On top of the file, we have some metadata that will help CodeQL to understand what we are trying to do. Ignore them for now. We then imported the Tain Tracking Library, which is a template configuration to, tra to track untrusted user input, followed by the data flow path graph library, which is all about the visualization of results at the end. We are defining a class here on line 11 to help us out, as the chain tracking configuration is a boilerplate. So this class is extending something to help ourselves with inheritance composition and uh, the expressiveness of the language. And this is actually an example of how users can benefit from extensibility. And through classes, the expressiveness of a language is highlighted. Another important feature on top of SQL is code reusability with predicates, like in line 14 and 18. Predicates provide a way to encapsulate portions of logic in a program so that they can be reused. Think about them as functions in CodeQL. What's important is how we are going to define 
the is source predicate and the is sync. We just have to override them using the code that we have already written from before. The code that we've written here and here that we are essentially, essentially going to transfer into the boilerplate. Just before filling in the predicates, let's briefly talk about this idea of data flow being represented by a graph with nodes so that when there's flow from one node to another node, then you know that these two nodes are connected. And I'm saying this because the two methods here, the one in line 14 and the one in line 18, namely in source and is sync, are getting a variable of type node as input. And this is exactly to find if there exists a data flow from sources to syncs, so that if there exists, we know that we have a confirmed vulnerability, which is critical because it's an SQL injection. We can now fill the predicates with the code we have just written before. I'm gonna use the exist, exists keyword here to introduce you uh, to that as well. And I'm gonna explain how we can read that. So, so far we can have, we can say that there exists a method call that is having the variable call so that if that method call is specifically get text, we have untrusted user input entering with the potential of being malicious. Let's use here the code. Oops. Copying and pasting really. Okay. So the way that we can read this is that there exists a method such that when that method is specifically the get text, we know that we have untrusted user input entering our code base. And we know that when untrusted user input enters our code base, there's the potential of that to be malicious. So that was the source. Let's continue with the sync with the exact same strategy. There exists a method call such that. So this becomes so that when row query is called with an argument in index zero, you know that you have the sync. Let's copy and paste again. So this should become node as expression. Okay. So what I've done was just filling the two uh, template placeholders with the code we've used before. And if we run that, we expect CodeQL to tell us if we have indeed SQL injections happening in our code base. So let's analyze what this says. If we click on the first SQL injection finding, we have two pathways to explore. In the first one, we know that we have the username type, the user being passed to the code base that was then passed into the login method, followed by the definition of the login method before being executed in the database. And here we have another pathway of the same variable is again, the username variable. And this time, instead of going through line 102, it went through line 116 so observe here, line 102 and line 116, I'm highlighting them both. You can see that in the first pathway, we have something equaling true, while in the other one, we have something equaling false, but those two pathways are both going towards an SQL injection vulnerability. And here, if we have um, a look at our other occurrence, we can see that Instead of having the username variable, we have the password variable, which is following the exact same pathway as the user. Sometimes the path from a user input to the real SQL injection can be very long with more than 10 steps across several files, functions, different places of the code base, libraries. Imagine how difficult it would be to find those manually. Let CodeQL do it for you. Back to our presentation and the final slide. Finally, you can start your CodeQL journey by visiting the following URLs 
that are also shared with you in the description of this stream. And here we are. Everyone, thanks for your time. And thank you, 30 Minutes to Merge, for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining. So before uh, we go into any more like thanks and whatnot, we do have a question in chat that I was actually about to interrupt you with, uh, but then you you wrapped up. So uh, Chad asked, um, these analyzers seem fragile to changes in the code library signatures. So like the names and arguments, are there best practices to make your code QL queries more resilient to change in the libraries? So I would say that to avoid this, we try to make CodeQL queries as generic as possible so that they are resistant in those code changes and they focused on functionality. Um, of course, if a, name, if a method name changes, then you have to adapt your CodeQL queries. But this is in cases where you are using a very specific, let's say, home a library that the company is using the organization or an open source maintainer. If we take the example that we just had from the Android widget or in general Java, you know that for these libraries, they will never change uh, code names so easily in order to maintain backtrack functionality and, and avoid breaking everything in our world in uh, in a moment, basically. So uh, definitely there are cases where you need to adapt your code QL queries based on the code. But since our community is contributing into code QL queries, GitHub is contributing to code QL queries, top security teams like the one of NASA, like the one of Mercado Libre that we had three months ago in our demo days, you know that this uh, group of people are focusing in libraries of open source that are out there. And that's why they contribute uh, queries to secure the open source. Awesome. All right. Well, really good response. Thank you very much. I don't see any other uh, questions in chat. So if anyone has any, just throw them in chat. Um, and if you're typing something really long, maybe just like throw like a give me a second uh, and just let us know. Um, but yeah, for thank sure. you so much for for joining. It was a really awesome session. You really broke down like how to get started with CodeQL um, within your your repository and then like how you might actually use it or how you could see some benefits from it pretty early. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thanks again for joining and uh, for everyone out there uh, watching today. I just wanted to say thanks for joining us again. It's always a pleasure for me to host these things and I look forward to our next 30 minutes to merge session. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Great rest of your week. And, uh, I'll see you next month, hopefully for another 30 minutes to merge with another awesome host, uh, where we get to talk about all things Git and GitHub. So thanks again and have a great one. Thank you, Martin, everyone.